So good day from the Radiant Professionals Alliance. Welcome to Hydronics Talk, the presentation of the Radiant Professionals Alliance. This is Mark Etherton, your monthly host and the executive director of the RPA. I've been a, man, a member for the last 20 years, contributing editor to Contractor Magazine for about the last 18 years, educator for 39 years, former expert witness, and still a licensed master plumber, although I don't let people know that because they say, hey, come play cards. Hey, you got one of the toilet plungers. The rules of the road, if possible, if you wanted to speak during this presentation, we ask that you use uh, headphones with a boom mic if possible, and just some of those little phone buds, earbuds with the microphone will work great. Uh, please mute your mic to avoid any feedback and background noises entering into the conversation. If you have a question that you would like to ask of our guest, put it into the Q&A text box, and uh, I will interrupt him during his presentation and have him address your questions. If you want to hold on to your questions until the end, feel free to do that, and then uh, we can answer them at the end of the presentation too. I would like to uh, thank everybody for attending. Here's the only advertisement that you will see in our little show here, which is for the Radiant Professionals Alliance. If you are not a member, we ask that you please join. This is an organization of the members, by the members, for the members, with the hydronic, radiant heating and cooling industry in mind. Our talk show is a monthly guest interviewed. We have open Q&A sessions following the interview, which may or may not pertain to whatever it is that we're speaking about. So if you've got a nagging problem that you want some input from our friends that are attending the show on, uh, feel free to ask those kind of questions and we'll address them as best we can. These shows are archived for members only and for review at a later date. The live shows are open to anybody that is willing to attend, but after the fact, you have to be a member of the RPA in order to be able to gain access to it. These shows are meant to be fun, educational, and entertaining. If you have some that you would like to be a guest interviewee, submit them to me at mark.etherton at ifmo.org, and I will contact them and see if they're interested in doing it. Quickly go through some hydronic news that you can use. The ASSC Standard 19210 Hydronic Certification Training is available for presentation at manufacturers, manufacturers reps, and qualified wholesalers. Uh, this is a three-day program, 24 contact hours in class, uh, I, Mark Etherton, would be your instructor at this point in time. We have 11 other trained instructors that will eventually be coming available online, uh, but for the time being, I'm taking care of everything. Uh, our AHR Expo, which is in January 30th, 31st, and February 1st in Las Vegas. There's the uh, URL for being able to get information on that. The RPA holds their annual meeting in conjunction with AHR along with our educational programs, and we've got five different classes that we're putting on this year that uh, have proven to be very interesting to previous year's educational efforts. We have our RPA University fall course offerings, which are listed on the URLs that you can see here. If you go to heatspring.com and click on their general course information, you can find the RPA University. We have numerous class offerings up there and uh, always working on more classes trying to fulfill that need for our contractor membership base and provide them with a place where they can learn and do it in a fashion that's conducive to their lifestyle. And it's a disclaimer, here's my lawyers. The graphics and illustrations used in this webinar are presented for educational purposes only. RPI Atmo does not endorse or recommend the vendor product depicted, nor any vendor or product. RPI Atmo makes no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assumes no responsibility for the products depicted, and RPI Atmo expressly disclaims all liability for any damages of any kind arising out of the use of the performance of the vendor's products or services depicted. Enough of the lawyers. Finish getting this switched over here real quick. And here's our today's guest, Kurt. Nagus with Axiom Industries. Kirk, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. You are in control, sir. Excellent. Well, thank you. Oh, there I am. We'll, we'll click on through this one here. Uh, for those of you who don't know Axiom Industries or any of the history, um, we're a Canadian-based manufacturer of specialty products for hydronic systems. 
Uh, we got our start uh, over 20 years ago, about 22 years ago, manufacturing package system feeders or glycol feeders. Um, and uh, grew and developed that sort of line of products. And in the coming years, um, started to come out with, um, broaden our product offering, started manufacturing condensate neutralizers, um, some other specialty products such as side stream filter packages, chemical bypass feeder, recently some uh, H2O demineralizers, uh, and also some new products. Um, so uh, we just moved into a, a new manufacturing facility here a few weeks ago um, and uh, pride ourselves in, in manufacturing niche products for the hydronics industry. And today I'll be talking about um, mainly uh, system pressurization units. I'll talk about uh, why it's necessary to maintain pressure in closed hydronic systems, um, explain the conventional method uh, of providing adequate system pressurization, and then introduce to you or elaborate on uh, a better way sort of to get the job done using one of our packet system feeders. Also talk briefly near the end about condensate neutralization and uh, chemical cleaning and protection for closed loop hydronic systems. Closed loop system pressurization. Cold fill pressure is required to push fluid to the, soft, to the top of any closed system. This adequate pressure must exist to vent air at all points in the system. Circulators are there simply to circulate the water around, whereas cold static fill pressure is to maintain that, that static fill pressure to push fluid to every point in the system to maintain that positive pressure. Uh, and if you don't maintain that positive pressure at all places, you can get pumps and control valves to make levitate. Uh, and this is especially evident in heating systems where the water is obviously warmer than that typical um, atmospheric temperatures. So the cold static fill pressure is um, basically um, is the height of the system from the fill point. So if you look at the little diagram there on the right side, you can see typically uh, the boiler components are usually housed in a mechanical room in the basement somewhere. And then you've got pipes distributed throughout the building or house. And the highest point is, uh, let's say in this instance, for example, it's 30 feet from the fill point. Um, the pressure um, uh, to push fluid to 30 feet high within that closed loop system that's required is about 13 PSI because it's uh, one PSI, 2.3 feet of elevation. And then you obviously require a positive pressure at every point. So um, the industry standard is to sort of have at least four to five PSI of pressure at the highest point. So in this case, the static fill pressure required would be about 18 PSI if the highest point in your system is 30 feet feet above that fill point. So fairly easy to calculate. It's pressure for various reasons. Uh, there's three main reasons, one of which is venting air. Uh, another one is leaks. And then obviously when you, you're draining fluid for service or modification. And if this system uh, pressure is lost, it must be regain to avoid operating problems. So venting of air, um, newly filled systems must vent air that's trapped in the system and entrained in the fluid. Um, typically, if you fill a hydronic system and you properly purge all the big air bubbles and stuff out of it, uh, three to 5% of that total system volume is gonna be air that is entrained in the fluid. Uh, much like that glass of water you get before you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, there's all these bubbles out on the side of the, of the glass that have been, came out of the fluid that were entrained in the fluid. Um, so um, that has to be vented out or, or usually vented out if you're with a properly placed air vent. And then uh, pressure in the system will go down. As this air is vented, the pressure drops. And this process can take a while. It can take uh, several days or a few weeks. And the system may have to be 
the pressure may have to be topped up several times before all the air is adequately vented out. Leaks. Closed hydronic systems leak, and sometimes this is in obscure places. Uh, pump steels, valve packings, mechanical piping connections, automatic air vents that are under negative pressure can drop, you know, draw air in. Uh, leaks are a slow death because oxygen, calcium, chlorides, and all other kinds of contaminants in the makeup water make their way into the system. So early detection and repair is a must. Some leaks are hard to detect. They can happen inside boilers on the heat exchanger. And in that case, uh, the fluid would uh, uh, potentially get vaporized by the combustion and just go out the flue. Or I've seen leaky heat exchangers um, leak water in through, and modern boilers have condensate traps or drains in the heat exchanger. So condensate or water can leak through the heat exchanger and down through the condensate drains, and uh, no one would ever know. Um, some people see, you know, if the condensate line is, is draining condensate, then people are told that's a good thing because running efficiently, but if the heat exchanger is leaking, um, you may never know. If that line continues to push fluid through it after the there is off, then you know you've got to leak. Uh, another place is behind insulating jackets, uh, in crawl spaces, and other obscure areas. And basically, the larger the system, the higher the potential there is for fluid losses. Yeah, Kirk, I had a system one time, it was a commercial apartment complex it had a about a million B2 an hour cast iron boiler that was doing space heat and domestic hot water. And I walked in and the relief valve was dumping about two gallons per minute into the floor drain. And I looked at the maintenance man and I said, how long has I been doing that? And he goes, well, let's see, I've been here for three years. And he said, George, the guy that trained me said it was doing it while he was here. So it's been like two years. And he said, so yeah, about five years. Isn't it supposed to? Oh. No. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a few similar stories like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, and it's that old adage: if that's the way we've always done it, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Yep. So comes he, in and was told it was that way, so uh, never question it. He actually thought it was supposed to be replenishing the water in the floor drain to keep the trap seal wet. And I said, no, nah. trap, trap, trap primer. Yeah, it's an expensive trap primer. Yeah. Uh, another reason for pressure loss is draining. Uh, when repairs or modifications are made, it's sometimes necessary to drain fluid. Uh, and unless this fluid is contaminated in some way, your best bet is to put it back into the system, even if it's just water. If water has been circulating in that system of yours for quite some time, obviously most of the oxygen and stuff has been taken, used up in it. Uh, dead water, we call that. So your best bet is just to put it back in the system, which is an easy way to do that. And this is also particularly important uh, for expensive anti-freeze solutions. Dumping the fluid has environmental implications like uh, methanol. Methanol is can that are used in the geothermal industry or ethylene glycol. Water quality. Uh, the concern over the quality of water in closed hydronic systems is increasing. Um, uh, these modern boilers typically have small, uh, smaller flow passages that are more prone to damage from poor quality water. Um, and uh, the water that comes out of the tap, essentially what you get, there's chlorides in it, um, calcium that can scale on it. There's all types of, uh, of, of things in the water that aren't necessarily good for the hydronic system. There's been several other presentations I've seen recently on here and in other places about the use of demineralized water promoting the use of good quality water that doesn't have a lot of those salts and minerals in it. Uh, low operating temperatures also make systems more susceptible to bacteria and algae growth as well. Uh, the typical method of maintaining pressure, or maintaining that cold static fill pressure in closed loop systems is what I call the raw water makeup method. Um, Essentially, it's a potable water line that's connected to the system through a fill valve or pressure reducing valve. Uh, it may include a bypass for fast filling. 
and some type of backflow prevention is usually required to avoid contamination of potable water, water systems. That can be uh, a double flow, a double check backflow preventer, a reduced pressure zone, an RPZ backflow preventer, testable backflow preventers. Uh, and there's very little control over the quality of the makeup water. Essentially, what you're getting out of uh, your domestic water supply is what's being introduced into your system. Here's a just a basic schematic uh, that mentioned potable water supply, backflow flow prevention device, uh, pressure reducing valve. Um, in some instances, uh, commercial instances, they put in a bypass to fast fill or, or purge the system. And so it's all those, those components and the associated piping that's tied into a hydronic system that typically maintains pressure. And there's, there's issues with this method. Uh, raw water feed is not the best op option because as we talked about before, oxygen and the other contaminants, contaminants that, that are in, in the water and introduced into the system. Uh, pressure reducing valve or fill valve suppliers in this connection be valved off when it's not required. And without a sensitive flow meter, there is no way to know how much water is being fed into the system. Uh, so if you do have a small leak, you don't necessarily know how bad it is. You don't even know if it's small, it could be quite big. Uh, and an open connection can cause a ma major flood and and cause damage if the system ruptures. If you have a failed fitting or um, a portion of the line freezes and expands the pipe to the point where it bursts. Uh, so this is a picture uh, I got off a well-known heating website uh, quite some time ago, probably over 10 years ago. A uh, contractor came, was called to a home because uh, the homeowner returned home and found his prized Porsche. Um, At least he had AAA insurance. <laughs> yeah. And uh, other problems is it's really a bad idea to feed raw water into systems with glycol solutions. Uh, obviously, glycol is in there for a reason. It's in there to protect the system from freezing. Um, so if you fill it with more water, you're just going to dilute that freeze protection. Another reason uh, glycol manufacturers have minimum dilution water requirements. Uh, requirements. So um, some say they don't want to see a, a concentration of glycol below 30%. Uh, so if all you put in is 30% glycol and you dilute that down, um, uh, one, you won't have the inhibitors that are in there to protect the system from corrosion, but they're also in there to protect the glycol from degrading as well. So your glycol can degrade much quicker. Um, it also leaves your system much more apt to be infested from or culture of bacteria. If there's oxygen and low concentrations of glycol below the minimum requirement, uh, it can also actually culture bacteria. Fluid that's drained surface also can't be easily put back in through a potable, potable water fill connection. And if operated according to manufacturer's recommendations, pressurization by potable water through a PRV is a manual operation and then you have to go and open the pressurization valve top off your system pressure. This is a, a label I got off a PRV manufacturer uh, quite some time ago. It just says, states that uh, corrosion and eventual failure of system components can result from the constant addition of fresh water. After the system has been filled, the cold water shutoff valve must be closed. This will the leaks from being undetected by the constant replacement of lost system fluid, system water. Failure to follow these instructions could result in property dam damage and or moderate damage. And so they're, um, they're just stating there that they want it closed. So uh, if something does happen, you're not going to have your porch covered in ice. And uh, backflow prevention, uh, depending on local codes, some form of backflow prevention will be required. As I mentioned before, there's a double flow check, uh, are uh, many different types, but it depends on local codes. And, and they're also not an absolute guarantee that no cross connection will occur. They are mechanical, uh, a, uh, a mechanical device. Uh, mechanical components do fail from time to time. Uh, 
these devices um, may require annual inspection and recertification. And over the life of the system, this can be big bucks. So user, whether it be a homeowner or a building over, uh, having somebody coming in on an annual basis to check it out uh, adds to the bottom line. And just to clarify, if you have a potable water connection to your heating system, you have to have some means of backflow prevention. So by using your system, you eliminate the need for that expensive annual maintenance backflow prevention device. Correct. So uh, there is a better way, and that's to use a packaged system feeder. Uh, the industry also calls them glycol feeders. Uh, I like to call them packaged system feeders because I like to promote them for use on systems that require just water. Uh, but they automatically maintain the required cold fill pressure in closed hydronic systems without any connection to a potable water system. They can feed a solution that's compatible with the system, a glycol solution, uh, good quality demineralized water, or anything else. A packaged system feeder will not cause a flood. Only the contents of the tank can be pumped into the system if something were to happen. So uh, if something were to happen, you may only come to find a few gallons of fluid on the floor uh, not several hundred gallons or thousands of gallons if that fill valve was left open. Fluids that are stored in the feeder atmospheric pressure and room temperature will have much less entrained air than potable water. And monitoring the tank level indicates exactly how much fluid the system is taking. If you've got a very minor leak, uh, you've lost you know, a gallon over the course of the winter, you know that it's very small and it's something you should maybe get to and look at, but uh, you don't necessarily have to shut the heating system down. If you've lost Alan overnight, uh, you gotta find out where that leak is and repair it immediately. Feeders can also be alarmed for loss of fluid or pressure. Um, so in the event you're at a residence that is uninhabited for a good portion of the year. It's a vacation home. Um, uh, low fluid level or pressure loss can actually be a good indication of that there's a leak or something wrong with the system. So essentially it's a set of dry contacts on the units or on the optional low level alarm panel uh, that can be tied into whether it be a building management system, home security system, interlock to turn boilers down, whatever you, you want it to do. It can be a, a means of uh, have an indication of a leak or that something is wrong with your system. Fluid that's drained for service reasons can simply be poured back into the tank. Um, you can go do your, uh, your uh, change of control, whatever it may be, um, and then simply dump the fluid back into the reservoir. Also, if the elevation is available, discharges from leak valves, air vents can be piped to the feeder tank to recover that fluid as well. A package system feeder will maintain system pressure during startup venting, so there's no need for manual topping off, uh, no low pressure problems, and no potential for flooding. So, uh, our package system feeders are sized in a way in such that um, there's enough volume of fluid in the feeder to get you through the first few weeks of operation to vent that three to five percent of the total system volume that will be vented out all that oxygen or air that's going to be vented out of your system there's going to be adequate fluid in that tank um, to keep the boilers running and things operating correctly so they make good sense in any closed hydronic system and especially for systems glycol solutions in them or where the quality of water on site is questionable um, also, if you have well water and don't want to risk contaminating it through a failed backflow preventer, um, I know I wouldn't want to risk that. So, it's a good reason to use one there. And so, you can replace. Sorry, very Mark, go ahead. Uh, quickly, I wanted to point something out. Go back one slide. Uh, back when I was still in the contracting business here in Denver with Advanced Hydronics, our insurance company approached us and asked us to use these systems. And their reasoning was is that they needed some means of being able to limit their liability. 
And when they discovered that we were putting one foot of pipe per square foot of living space, they had a hissy. And they said, you've got to do something to limit our liability or we're going to cease insuring you. And so we approached them with this and they said, that will work. And as you said, you can't lose any more than the volume that's within that tank other than what the system might be holding, but it's not thousands of gallons of water that would possibly do damage. So uh, my recommendation to a contractor would be to talk to their insurance company and see if they could convince them to provide a discount if they provide this type of a makeup package to a heating system, which is going to limit their liability. Well, I know they reduce your uh, the premiums if you remove the fireplace from the building. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, same kind of thing. You're, re you're reducing another liability, so it's less chance of something happening. But, yeah. Um, so yes, uh, as you can see, you can replace all of that uh, with a piston feeder or a pressure valve. This is our uh, most common residential unit. It's called the, it's called the MF200 pressure valve. Consists of a six-gallon tank, six-gallon tank. Or uh, it has an adjustable pressure set point from 10 to 25 psi. And we limit it at 25 psi because typical uh, residential pressure relief valves are somewhere or are 30 psi, and we don't want you know somebody uh, to crank it up too high. But we do have uh, solar units and other uh, specific units that go to higher pressures. Uh, it has a purge and mix valve, which allows the pump to self prime on startup. But it's also a nice uh, feature in that. Uh, if you're going to do service or modification to a system that's pressurized, you can simply unplug the unit, um, open up that valve, and the contents of the expansion tank are going to come out and back into the feeder tank. You don't have to physically drain fluid from somewhere else in the system. So you can go ahead, do your service or modification, close it back up, dump whatever fluid you may have collected uh, during your service back into the tank, and once you plug it back in, it's just going to simply feed back into the system to pressurize it back up. There's also a low level cutout on it. So in the event um, you do run out of fluid, uh, the pump's not gonna continuously run dry <clears throat> on and on. Um, a few years ago, we added a fill funnel that's included that can, that is, that hangs inside the tank, but can be removed and, be removed and threaded into the top of the cap. This is just so uh, if the feeder's placed up on a wall or in a corner uh, uh, somewhere, it just makes it easier to uh, replenish the fluid in the tank. There's also an optional wall mounting bracket and low level alarm. We, I should mention too, I was gonna change the slide but didn't have time, that we do have an MF200-LPA version and that's a low pressure uh, comes built into that particular unit. So let's say the unit was set for 18 PSI, and for some reason you develop a leak, uh, the pressure goes down, and there isn't enough fluid in the unit to maintain pressure. If the pressure were to continue to drop five PSI below that set point, a set, second set of normally closed contacts open, and then you can use that to you know, tie into the building management system, have some sort of interlock on the border or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, this particular unit is also um, recommended for systems that have about 75 gallons or less. And it comes with a UL listed power supply as well. <clears throat> this is our MF300, the next size up. Essentially, it has all the same features, identical to the MF200, and takes up the same footprint. It just has a larger stretched out tank for a uh, larger volume of storage. So we recommend this for use on systems with a volume between 75 and 300 gallons. This SF100 Pressure Pro is our most commercial sized unit. Comes with a 55 gallon gallon reservoir and an accumulator tank. Um, it has a maximum uh, fill pressure of 55 PSI, which is good to up to about a 10 or 12 story building, depending upon um, how many feet per story you have in that building. 
and uh, it's an adjustable range from 5 up to 55 PSI. It comes preset at about 12 PSI, I believe. It plugs into a 115-volt outlet. also comes with a purge mix valve uh, like the MF200 and MF300. Uh, flexible hose with check valve included. Uh, Low-level cutout, and we recommend this unit for system volumes above 300 gallons. It also has an optional low-level alarm panel, and this unit here is electrically certified. So. This is just a quick slide on the low-level alarm panel for the SF100. Um, it has power on indicating lights. It has an audible alarm that you can actually silence when the alarm is on, or you can actually disable, the, disable it as well. It has a set of dry contacts that can be tied into the building management system. And the feeder plugs into the panel, so it cuts out power to the feeder in the event of a low level. Um, so it has the visual, audible, and remote um, indication of a low level. We also build several different variations of this unit. An SF100L that has uh, extra large storage, so 100 gallon tank, which is typically used in very large systems or in remote locations. The SF100 HP, uh, which is a high pressure version for high pressure applications. And we have a 100-2 PRV, which you can utilize one system feeder to, to feed uh, um, two separate closed loops. So as long as the fluid that's being used in the system is compatible for each closed lip, loop, as the, it's a, <clears throat> a chilled water system and a heating system, you can, you can use one unit to feed both systems. Just a few notes uh, on our system. All of our units are, are electrically certified and plug into a 115-volt wall outlet. And we also have the ability to make custom units. Are there any questions at this time on the Actium feeders? I am not seeing any right now, but if any pop up, I'll let you know. Okay. So moving along here to condensate mutation. Um, this is a topic that's been talked about for quite some time, ever since uh, we started using uh, condensing boilers here in North America. Uh, the condensate uh, from these condensing gas-fired appliances, be it a, a boiler, a hot water heater, furnace, uh, it's acidic and uh, it can corrode drains. Um, so this condensate forms as a byproduct of the combustion process. But uh, the little equation there with uh, natural gas with oxygen um, will create H2O, CO2, and obviously energy, which is what you want out of it. But during combustions, uh, there's constituents of the fuel and of the combustion air that create compounds which will shift the pH value of the condensate to acidic levels. Um, the sulfur content in the fuel is responsible for the creation of a, the creation of a mild sulfuric acid. There's also nitrates that are, are, are responsible for some nitritic acids. Um, typically, we see the pH range, and it depends on a number of factors. <clears throat> in the range of about three and a half, low threes to up to about five. An acidic condensate can corrode piping and cause costly repairs in copper, cast iron, concrete, brass components, uh, pretty much anything but plastic. Uh, it also has the potential to harm the environment and or the septic field. Um, septic fields require uh, certain things in order to um, culture that bacteria and break down those solids and whatnot. So if you've got uh, a lot of condensate dumping into that, it can bring it in, your pH into a range where um, it's not good for your septic tank. These are uh, just uh, a few pictures that I've got from, from reps of ours and, and team uh, posted over the years here, but it, in all these pictures, um, the service life of this pipe was claimed to be somewhere in the range of about two to three years. 
You know, I did a job for a guy up here in the mountains, and he wanted everything to be copper, including the condensate lines. Oh, and I said, they're going to rot out. I said, within a year, you're going to have me back up here doing that. And he goes, well, let's just go ahead and do it. I just want to take pictures from my albums and stuff. So we did. He polished them. He waxed them. And I was there in less than a year because the condensate copper lines were dreaky. Mm -hmm. I have pictures of a flexible gas line um, that was actually uh, inside a, a boiler housing that condensate uh, was dripping out of this poor connection at the bottom of the heat exchanger on the gas line and formed pinhole leaks on the flexible natural gas line. On uh, stainless steel? Uh, yes. Going yeah. On, going on to uh, um, over to the gas valve. Now, people Actually, seem to think that stainless steel is impervious to everything, and it's not. It's stain resistant. It's not I've actually, stainless. I actually had the guy send it to me. I've got it in my office here. I should take some pictures and include it in my next presentation. It's CSST down there to the lower right-hand side of your picture on the right-hand side there, too. That's mm -hmm. uh, covered with plastic, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. This one wasn't. It was inside um, the, the boiler shroud. I've also seen it eat the septic tanks, concrete septic tanks, right at the standing water line. Mm -hmm. And that's not pretty. It's pretty expensive to repair. Mm -hmm. So there is a better way to deal with this condensate line, condensate, and just uh, dump it down the drain into the septic system, and that's use a condensate neutralizer, uh, three of which we offer right now various sizes, depending upon the application. We also have a version that has a pump built into the outlet as well. So if there isn't a convenient place to, uh, to drain or there isn't sufficient elevation, uh, the unit with the pump can be used. And this is our most popular, obviously, residential size unit. It's called the NT1 Nutripal Condensate Neutralization Capsule. It comes with everything you need to uh, install uh, floor and wall mounting clamps, three inch NPT inlet outlet connections. We also provide it as a kit with 10 feet of hose. Uh, they come with NPT and hose barbed adapters. Uh, and two unions are supplied with every unit as well for easy media replacement. In each of our capsules, we actually have a, a screen that holds the media within the capsule to prevent that media from clogging the inlet and outlets of the capsule. And the capacity of this unit is 1.6 gallons per hour. Now that's approximately a 300,000 BTU per up operating at approximately 94% efficiency. And the rule of thumb in the industry is for every 100,000 BTU per hour, you can potentially get one gallon per hour of condensate. Now that's if the heat exchanger is operating at 100% efficiency, if the combustion is there, is saturated, uh, it is very humid. So um, in real world conditions, um, appliances are, are at their, if, uh, if possible, at their AFU efficiency, typically in the low to mid 90s. So the actual condensate capacity is, is, is usually a fair amount less. And we offer um, sizing calculators on our website so you can simply input uh, the BTU input and the AFU efficiency of the appliance and it will select an appropriate neutralizer for your application. I think that one gallon per minute per 100,000 BTU's capacity is probably a uh, snow melt system in the Arctic, yeah. a cold <laughs> yeah. startup, acceleration cold startup. conditions with a 99% thermal efficiency factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rare. And all of our units obviously come with the initial charge of Axiom Lifter Media. Uh, it's a blend of uh, calcium carbonate and magnesium. What is the life expectancy on that media? Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the answer is it depends, but... Yeah, it's going to depend. Um, uh, it's designed to last a year. Uh, it can last much longer. But as you know, uh, there are all <laughs> a, a lot of other things that can happen. Um, if you do have poor quality combustion air, because it's essentially a trap, um, that's another thing I should point out is our, our 
capsules have an offset outlet to retain as much fluid inside the capsule as possible to ensure that the resident time or the contact time in the media is maximized. But uh, things collect in there. So, um, like as I mentioned, poor quality combustion air, you know, these things are going to collect in the trap and, and coat and, uh, and, and block these things. Um, um, as some manufacturers may not like to admit it, but there are particles of the heat exchanger and stuff that also find their way into the trap and get collected in here that can, can prevent um, the contact of, with the media. So that's one reason why we also make our, our capsules clear. So uh, it gives early indication that if uh, there is something like that happening, it can be serviced at a regular basis. Um, you can actually flush it out and clean it out or just replace it. What's the approximate cost of the um, media replacement? The media replacement is uh, pretty negligible considering you've got somebody there uh, changing it. I don't like to usually say pricing um, because there's, you know, the shipping and all that kind of involved, but it would be well under half the price of the cost of the unit itself to replace yeah. the media. That's cheap and they're going to be there anyway. Might as well yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's why we recommend changing it as part of the normal annual boiler mix. Because more often than not, uh, the media is not depleted. It's more, uh, you know, the the stuff that's getting caught through there that's, that's, that's you know, um, clogging it up and coating it and whatnot from poor combustion or just debris from poor quality combustion air. This is our NC2 new, NC new Nutripal. Um, all the same features as the NC1, obviously just an increased capacity as it's uh, lengthened. And this one's uh, four gallons per hour, which is approximately a million BTU per hour application operating at about 92% of its maintenance. This is our NT25 condensate neutralization tank, the low profile design. Uh, with baffles, uh, so it just more effectively utilizes the volume of fluid and media in the tank by forcing the condensate through a longer flow path uh, to make sure that the residence time or contact time uh, with the media is extended as much as possible. There's also a, a built-in bypass over overflow, so should this become neglected and not um, the media not changed or unit not cleaned out uh, as part of the normal service, um, it's not going to back up into the boiler. There's a built-in bypass overflow channel to allow that to, to bypass as required. And this is suitable for appliances that produce up to uh, 45 gallons per hour. And that's uh, about a 7 million BTL per hour input appliance operating at 96%. And of course, it comes with the initial charge of media. I like that play on words you've got there for lifter. <laughs> yeah. uh, any questions about uh, axiom neutralizers? I'm not seeing any on the board at the time. Okay. Doing a good job. Moving along then. Uh, recently, Axiom unveiled a, um, a complete line of uh, products to properly clean and protect hydronic closed loop systems. And it's important to use a cleaner that's for the purpose you're cleaning it for. Uh, we've got a couple different, we've got two types of cleaners for closed loop systems. One's designed for new hydronic systems. Typically what you're going to see in there is cutting oil, flux, um, and some metal oxides. So you're going to have one that caters to, to cleaning out those when you clean and flush new systems. And then our Clean 5 is a system cleaner for old, old hydronic systems that removes more sludge and metal oxides from the hydronic systems as well as scale and stuff on the heat exchangers and boilers. And they're all effective and, and easy to use, uh, non-hazardous, can simply be drained down the drain and out. Um, where was that? Oh, th it's also uh, designed to be used with all the different metals that are used in systems. Aluminum, stainless steel, copper, all the typical plastic, PEX, and, uh, and steel, ZB, and safe to be used on all that. 
We also have a system corrosion and scale inhibitor. Um, it can help provide energy savings by protecting against corrosion and lime scale on heat exchangers. And it's suitable for all metals that are typically used in HVAC systems, hydraulic systems. Inhibitor levels can be checked and replenished if required. Simply, you simply put into a device with a litmus test type paper and, um, and then compare the, the colors. And if it's required, you just add a little bit more. This is just a, a quick photograph that I just wanted to show that um, shows kind of how the system corrosion and scale inhibitor works. The middle jar there is actually the sort of the five nails in the jar test. And that's just after three hours. And that's Saskatoon city water where I'm from. Uh, the conductivity level of the time of the tap water was uh, 221 parts per million or 335 microsiemens. So after three hours, you can see the corrosion, sorry, the corrosion um, process is already well under the way. It's actually difficult to see through. Um, the jar on the left is demineralized water with the same five nails in the jar after the same amount of time. So corrosion will be taking place in that jar, but it's at a much slower rate because the conductivity level of the solution in there is, uh, is much lower than the Saskatoon City water, obviously. So uh, like I said, corrosion will be taking its place in there at a much slower rate. It's gonna take much more time to get to the point that that middle jar is. Uh, the jar on the right is the Saskatoon City water, so the same water uh, of the jar in the middle there, um, but it's got a 0.5% dosage of the Protect 1 Axitherm, uh, and that's after three hours. You can see uh, it's got a protective barrier on the, on the metal that's going to prevent corrosion. Um, and the other product category with it system cleaners is our combustion side cleaner. It's actually the industry's first liquid cleaner specifically designed to clean the combustion side of heat exchangers in condensing boilers. And they come in one liter bottles with a convenient uh, spray handle with extension nozzle that allows um, you to get uh, you know, a better angle on all the nooks and crannies uh, of the inside the side of a heat exchanger. And it helps remove the combustion residue from the fire side of the heat exchanger in stainless steel, copper, or aluminum condensing boilers. Um, condensing boilers, it seems to be the more they condense, obviously the more energy and the more efficient they're running, but the more buildup there is on it too. And we also tend to see more buildup on the dry side of the heat exchanger if you're using um, uh, poor quality gas or uh, liquid propane, there's actually quite a bit of the natural gas, so you'll have to clean it more often. And by cleaning it, you provide energy savings by helping restore heat transfer to original levels. So if you're cleaning a stainless steel or copper heat exchanger, uh, you use the F9A cleaner only. Uh, if you're cleaning an aluminum heat exchanger, um, it's a two-step process. You use the clean F9A, then you clean F9B. The reason for that, aluminum doesn't like caustic solution, so spray on an acid to counteract or neutralize that. That's also going to passivate the aluminum and put that nat natural aluminum oxide barrier back on the aluminum that's naturally going to protect it from corrosion. So I do have a few pictures of this in action. This actually happens to be uh, my personal boiler in my house, so doing some baseboard radiation, um, a little bit of slap heat in the heat pad. Um, so that's some build up after about eight or nine years of operation. And as you can see, I thoroughly cleaned it with the clean F9A um, and then let it sit for 15 to 20 minutes and then rinse it off and, and, uh, and spray it off. And then I proceeded to spray it with the clean F9B and then uh, let it sit for 15 to 20 minutes and then <clears throat> rinse it off. And as you can see, that's, that looks quite clean. I took due care and attention because I knew I'd be taking photos uh, for this, but um, it's actually um, quite um, quite clean. So, so does it not, doesn't require any kind of 
uh, physical agitation, then you don't have to hit it with a plastic brush or anything. No, yes, uh, it, it it dissolve it helps dissolve all that buildup. But yes, there are the bigger chunks and things that I didn't want to waste, you know, a, a, a bunch of liquid to dissolve them completely. So I literally just flicked them out with a plastic stick and vacuumed them out as well too, because the larger a lot of the larger particles are big clumps, as you see in these pictures here. Mm-hmm. This uh, this boiler was on a uh, doing a building in a dog kennel, and so it was strictly floor heat, lots of condensing. Um, this is after eight years of operation. This guy actually had a service contract where the guy came to check it every year. He obviously didn't look in the dry side, and um, and this is what happened this last fall when he came when when somebody finally opened up because the boiler simply would not fire. Um, so uh, this is after a thorough cleaning of the F9. If you've ever attempted to clean this type of thing, most people would rather just write off the boiler and uh, sell them a new one. But, um, I had well. an aluminum block boiler like this that was on a horse barn, mm-hmm. and the combustion air intake was 30 feet off the deck. But when the horses were running around outside, it would actually cause dust to go up, and we were inducing mm-hmm. that into the combustion process, and that lower left-hand picture is what his burner assembly looked like after about two years. Oh, yeah. We ended up having to put an air filter on it in order to uh, reduce the contaminants getting into the combustion process. Yeah, you know, I've heard of that too. Yeah, that, that's a good suggestion for him too. That could be one of the reasons why this is happening too. Um, this next picture is a copper finned tube boiler. This was cleaned uh, um, by a contractor uh, of, who works for a property management company. Uh, as you can see, it was thoroughly clogged to the point where um, um, it gets really passed through the copper fin um, to the point where that the picture, you know, in the bottom center there, uh, that those are stainless steel burners that simply became roasted and had to be replaced. And this is the typical stainless steel coil wound heat exchanger. You hear Gianoni, Gianoni. <laughs> so, Crypt, do you guys actually have any kind of a kit? I know over in Europe they have kits that they sell that has like a cover that you can put over that insulation panel that's in the back and secure it and then special brushes and the brushes are obviously non-metallic but they basically allow you to go in and do a real good spin clean on the uh, gaps between those heat exchangers does your company provide any product in that way no not any, anything over and above what that little spray nozzle has with the extension have all and i think i know what you're talking about it looks like a a uh, like a pressure washer gun with a rod mm-hmm. and a little spindle on the end. We ha- we don't have anything like that. Um, it, it's specific to one type of heat exchanger, um, so uh, we haven't developed that yet. But um, I can see how useful it would be on something like this. That getting you know some good pressure at a good angle in those crevices would uh, would help too because the chemicals are are good uh, in, in part to start dissolving it and clean it off, but um, the passages are so fine in there that, you know, putting in, I've heard people using, you know, like um, gift card, plastic gift cards to really just get in there and, and scrape it out and tools and things to run. But we don't have anything like that to answer your question, not yet. Uh, I saved my door keys from all the hotels that I stay at for that very specific <laughs> purpose. I've got a briefcase half full of those too. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> And this is the uh, uh, the wet side cleaner that we have specifically for boiler heat exchangers. It's a high potency or high dosage. It's mixed at about a, a 10 to 20 percent dosage. It's meant meant for the heat exchanger and near boiler piping only. Um, it removes even the most persistent metal oxides and limestone buildup from the water side of heat exchangers. 
Um, it really helps help reduce the noise and provide energy, energy savings, obviously, by trying to <clears throat> uh, restore the heat transfer to an uh, initial level. We had a local contractor here um, attempt to clean uh, a boiler in a hospital. There was a, a retrofit that had been done. The contractor came in, changed out the boiler, um, cut the pipes off, didn't properly purge and flush the old distribution system. Uh, it ran fine for the first winter, but when it came time to fire it up in the fall, the boiler was limiting its firing rate to about 35% because it just couldn't extract enough heat. Um, so we, we attempted to clean out that heat exchanger with two other um, chemicals, and um, then I provided our clean boiler. We went there a week later and uh, let it circulate for about four hours. Um, he said you wouldn't believe the stuff that came out of it. Um, and uh, once once he had filled it back up and fired it back up, it had got back up to 80% uh, firing rate, and uh, it got him through through this last week. And, and then he returned in the spring to properly finish uh, and, and thoroughly clean that heat exchanger and, and, and clean the distribution system as well. So it got him through the first winter and cleaned what 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 other ones that he had tried couldn't. But it's designed for the the heat exchanger and near boiler piping only, not not designed to clean the entire distribution system. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, to view the presentation. If you guys do have any questions, I'd be happy to take those now, or um, I can be reached at uh, on our website. Uh, sorry, I don't have my email up here. Maybe it's in a, one of the other slides. I do. I'm actually regaining control here, and I'll finish this up by sliding through the slides. Again, just a second here. It's a long ways from Canada to Denver. <laughs> Here's his contact information: Kurt Nagus, K Nagus at AxioMind.com. <laughs> Axiom Industry, not AxioMind. Yeah, you're not the first person to do that. I know. <laughs> a Freudian slip on my part. And I'm not seeing any questions up here on the board right now. Does anybody have any questions that they would like me to uh, enable their mic and uh, possibly allow them to talk in? I see Al Dirks is here, Bob Rohr, Dale Arndt, Russ Guest. Anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask either of our guest or of us in general? I'm going to go ahead and enable Bob Rohr's It will let me. There we go. Hey, Bob. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. Any questions for our friend here? No, a uh, good presentation. I do have one question. You know, when we had a, a guy from Dow Chemical on last year do a webinar with us, and he said you always want to seal the, the container that has glycol because he said you'll break down the oxygen scavengers in it. Are the fill tanks sealed pretty tight that oxygen can get in, can't get in there, or is that a concern? Yeah, they are atmospheric pressure um, and, and the lid or cap on them seals, uh, okay. but there is a small opening uh, where the dip tube for the pump goes down into it. So there is a small area, obviously it couldn't be pressurized, but, uh, yeah. but um, it, it's not simply just open to atmosphere uh, all over the top like with the cap. It, it, it is fairly sealed, but there is, a, there is a small sort of annular hole around the side of it. Okay. Um, no, that's, that's, all one, that's one of the questions I get uh, um, the most about. Um, and um, one of the main things I'm told by the glycol manufacturers is just to ensure that, also to ensure that they have that minimum concentration of glycol that is not over diluted, because that's really when you can get into trouble because their oxygen scavengers and inhibitors are in there too protect that glycol from degrading and culturing bacteria so it's important to have you know you know i don't good, high mixture of glycol in there i don't know how true it is but i had a large condo project with a snow melt system up in breckenridge colorado and the maintenance guys there would pour oil motor oil directly on top of their glycol storage tank hmm. and they said that basically provided the seal and kept the oxygen from being able to get to the oil I don't know what the oxygen permeation rate for oil is, but mm -hmm. 
it's your mate for a mess. I know that. Mm -hmm. Oil and glycol and water don't like to mix real well. Well, you know, I, I don't see any other questions here. Mr. Ernst, I just enabled your microphone. Do you have any questions? No, I don't at this time. It was a really good presentation. I just finished up the 11,000 square foot building I'll be putting one of these in. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the business. I appreciate that. If you have any questions, you get Kirk's email. You can send him emails and find out what his cell phone number is and call him at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, it doesn't work. It's not plugged in. All right. Well, listen, I uh, think that you've had an excellent presentation. I appreciate you coming out, Kirk, and Team Axiom for everything that you guys do for our industry. I'm a firm believer in this product. I uh, personally think it should be illegal to have any automatic makeup connection to any heating system because the only good leak is no leak. And you don't know that you've got a leak until the damage has been done, and then it becomes very problematic. So would strongly recommend that uh, anybody and everybody that has an interest in hydronics look into these products and uh, take them for a spin. Our next guest is going to be Sal Deoria with Ventacity. Uh, they manufacture an ERV system that's used as a direct dedicated outdoor air system for use in uh, light commercial buildings where they uh, are basically trying to provide radiant cooling and it gives them the opportunity to be able to bring the moisture out of the air before they bring it into the building and keep the building under positive pressurization so that they don't have to worry about migration of moisture into their radiantly cooled panels. So uh, keep an eye out for the uh, presentation that will be set out shortly with our newsletter. And again, if you're not a member of the RPA, by all means, we invite you to come join this very worthwhile organization. And uh, we appreciate your time that you've invested. And uh, Kirk, thank you very much again for taking the time to come and give this presentation. And thank you to our guests for uh, taking the time to come and listen to it. And so until next month, we'll talk to you all later. Safe travels and we'll talk to you then. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.